the state of New South Wales in Australia, an incredible creature roaming the tropical forests where few dare to tread. From out of nowhere, this animal just came and pounced and grabbed it around the neck. Here, it's called the thylacine. Something jumps out from the gloom and disappears. It could jump like a kangaroo, but it could walk like a dog. They were really in interested in the blood. Yes, I've seen something like that too, but I didn't want, to, didn't want to say anything about it. Byron Bay, Australia, a paradise for surfers and nature lovers. This popular seaside resort attracts over a million visitors each year. These tourists don't suspect that just a few meters from the beaches, a mysterious beast, a cross between a tiger, a dog, and a kangaroo, freely roams the rainforest. Residents believe that this is a thalassine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger a creature thought to have disappeared from the Australian mainland over 4,000 years ago. Wendy Bethel organizes nocturnal guided tours in the jungles of Byron Bay. One night, she had the surprise of a lifetime. I take people out into the rainforest with the night vision goggles, um, and uh, we go looking for animals. So we see lots of normal Australian little animals. <laughs> Uh, we were looking at the at the paddy melons. There was maybe about six of them just grazing on this clearing, and then uh, from out of nowhere, this animal just came and pounced on one of the paddy melons and grabbed it around the neck. And and I just I just took me by surprise. So it was that stealthy, whatever it was, that even the paddy melons who hear one twig break and they're out of there, it it didn't hear it. I've been running tours out there for seven years, I've been going out, you know, into the rainforest, you know, three or four times a week, and that's the only time I've seen something that I couldn't explain. And I identify animals all the time, and so I'm used to looking at something and, tr and, and working out what it is I'm seeing, like you're listening, you're looking, and you're identifying attributes of the animal. I was going through that process and, I, and it, it didn't work. I was sitting there going, what was it? And then screamed, you know, let it go. And then it just ran off. I was thinking how cool it was that I'd saved the little paddy melon <laughs> from being eaten by something. Um, but then I started thinking about it, you know, what was it that I saw? And, the, and I still don't have an answer. Gary is, a, is a, one of the great people in this area knowing wildlife and, um, and so I was talking to him about it. He suggested what I seen might have been a thylacine. <laughs> Of the 317 animals that I'd received information on during the 17 years of my radio program, I'd also received reports on animals unknown to science. The cryptozoologist Gary Opit hosts a popular show on animal life on Australian public radio. He firmly believes in the existence of the thalassine. I also received phone calls from farmers and uh, forestry workers, National Park Rangers and uh, just local people who have seen animals that uh, are believed to be extinct. One of the most remarkable animals of all is the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger. Bruce Pringle is a sculptor whose work is inspired by the thylacine. For him, Byron Bay is more than the home of the mysterious creature. It's a paradise a place to be truly free. It's very precarious, little Bar Byron Bay. It's, it's this beautiful, sensitive, fragile beach and a little town. A lot of the people here are traveling through. Everybody's on holiday. Everybody's here expecting to have a good time. They're relaxed. So you walk down the street, there's a lot of people there in party mood. It's, re yeah, it's very pleasant. You know, it's just, uh, it's a fantastic beach. Every time you go up to the lighthouse, there's, there's a, an osprey, an eagle, you know, or, or a turtle in the water down there, or dolphins out there, or whales out there. And, and a lot of people come here looking for a bit of spiritual something, you know, because there's, it's that kind of feeling here. It's, uh, there's something, something here that lets you open up a little bit. It's, it's, it's a great place. You just see people doing all sorts of crazy things here. You see, uh, there's a guy that walks around Byron with a llama, like walking it like a dog, you know. It 
is an interesting place. The actual town of Byron Bay itself really only has 5,000 residents who live here. But we have 1.5 million tourists a year. <laughs> We've been doing this publication since 84, our little Byron, we call a Byron guy, which is stories about the spirit and feeling of Byron, you know? And what I think keeps us going after 31 years is we still haven't sort of nailed it because it's so diverse. And we say, oh, well, it's a place for retirees, it's a place no. for young people. Is it surfers? I mean, people come from all over the world to surf here, which was sort of the, the, the first thing that happened here was the surfers. People come because they can be themselves, and people yeah. change their lives. They come here, fall in love with the place. Literally, it's just every story that you hear, someone arrives from Adelaide and just decides to stay. Somehow it gets under your skin, and people feel free to change their name, change their occupation, and be who they want to be, and and this place allows that. So look in the back of our local free weekly independent paper called The Echo and you will find every kind of alternative healing medicine you want to ever think about. Acupuncture, <laughs> Chinese herbal therapy. But local newspapers aren't only interested in alternative lifestyles. Here, the thalassine, nicknamed the Tasmanian tiger, regularly makes headlines. Strange sights in the Australian bush. Tiger outside their tent. Woman claims they saw Tasmanian tiger. Credibility given to tiger sightings. Beast of Buddha am on the prowl. Genuine thylacine spotters earn their stripes. Panther or thylacine prowler gets around. Our uh, bulletin magazine uh, at one time uh, offered $1.25 million for evidence of thylacine surviving to the present. And if we do find evidence that it exists, it'll, it'll certainly make worldwide news. Gary Chigwidden is editor of the Byron Shire News, a skeptic at heart. He has nevertheless covered several stories related to the thalassine. Well, some years ago, um, I was listening to the local ABC radio, and uh, Gary Opert, he's a wildlife man who had a regular spot at that time on the radio, uh, spoke about a man from Mullumbimby who said he saw a thalassine or a Tasmanian tiger. And, my, and being the editor of the paper, my ears pricked up and said, oh, this could, be a, this could be a good story. It was three o'clock in the morning when Mick and Fabi saw an animal coming towards them along the side of the road as they were driving north. If it's not a dingo or a dog of any kind, its ears were well rounded and it was a lion gold colour. The tail was amazing, it was so long. As the car slowed down, Mick, who was sitting in the passenger seat, said he was less than two metres from the animal before it disappeared into the bush. And since that sighting, he said, he had spoken to at least 10 other local people who had made similar sightings stretching back a number of years. He, he was pretty sure he saw something that wasn't, that wasn't, a, um, that wasn't, a, regular, wasn't a dog or a regular thing that he'd seen. Uh, and he was fairly convinced uh, after doing some research that it, it was a uh, Tasmanian tiger, a thylacine. They weren't spinning me a yarn. They weren't just inventing a story. They, they were convinced they saw something. Uh, something a little bit different. So I, I spoke to Gary Opert, and, who told me afterwards that there'd been a fair number of sightings in that area uh, of a particular animal that looked like a thylacine. Um, and of course, when I ran the story in the Byron News, uh, it prompted other people to call me or contact me to say, oh, well, yes, I've seen something like that too, but I didn't want to, didn't want to say anything about it. That is what a Tasmanian tiger or thylacine looks like. How could a creature thought to be extinct for thousands of years resurface on the Australian continent? The only surviving thylacines were found on the island of Tasmania, south of Australia. They were known as aggressive predators before the islanders hunted them to extinction. The species was officially declared extinct in 1936. The Tasmanian tiger uh, is a marsupial and it looks very much like a dog and so it's been known as the marsupial dog or the marsupial wolf 
uh, and it's often referred to as the tiger because it has stripes on its back. The last thylacine images date to the early 1930s. But then, what have all those witnesses actually seen? Biologist Mary Gardner is interested in endangered species. She admits to having been shaken by some of the sighting reports. I, I walk through the area all the time, and one of the most exciting things is actually spotting the wide variety of different wildlife, and there's lots of it. And you get to expect certain things, and you can also be surprised, in spite of your training, to see things that um, you wouldn't think are possible. It's, it's a typical kind of story. It was uh, twilight, it was dusk. Every good story starts that way. Going along between the edge of the pavement and the uh, forest, something jumps out from the gloom and disappears again. The creature was caught in the headlights. And I thought, oh, that's very strange. And it didn't do anything that I thought it would, and it disappeared. And it was later that I went through ticking the boxes, trying to figure out what it was. And I thought, oh, that doesn't make sense. So that's, that's the mystery. Because what I ended up thinking I saw was um, a thylacine. What else has those kind of ears, that kind of bony rump, and the tail stripes, and that very rigid, strange tail. I rang up my friend Gary Opit, and I said, you've been here a long time, you've seen lots of things, what do you think? And he said, well, we just have to put this in my catalog of anecdotes. And there are, he's got quite a catalog of anecdotes. Majority of people living in cities, they don't really know what a Tasmanian tiger or a thylacine is. When they phone me up, they, they don't say, oh, I've seen a thylacine or I've seen a Tasmanian tiger. They say some mad person has, has bred a kangaroo and a dog together. You'd think it was going to be a dog, but it wasn't, and it wasn't a kangaroo. Well, it looks very much like a dog, more than anything else. It, it had a tail like a kangaroo. It could jump like a kangaroo, but it could walk like a dog. This here is a photograph that was sent to me by one of the, my listeners, and it shows you the uh, redneck wallaby that had been eaten on the grass outside his window under the clothesline. They hadn't heard anything, and it had made an incision down the belly, and it had, it, it had bitten out the stomach and taken it and placed it a little further away, and then it had eaten the intestines and all of the organs, the lungs and heart and, and uh, kidneys and liver, uh, and didn't touch uh, any meat on the body at all. It was, it was typical of the way that the thylacine is said to, to have hunted. They were really in interested in the blood and the real high protein food, the, 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 the organs, the, the heart and the liver and the kidneys. That, that's very good evidence that it may have been a thylacine. And many residents of Byron Bay share Gary Opitz's views. I think it could still be out there. There's a lot of space for them to be hiding, so it yeah. could be out there somewhere. A few, quite a few people spotted them and then one guy said, that was just my dog, but it wasn't. Like, he was, his dog was a... Um, Labrador, <laughs> like, it's just a barren thing. Like. We set up a camera trap or several camera traps just in the hope that uh, we might be able to photograph uh, one of these animals that had been reported to us. And this is the only photograph that uh, anyone's ever been able to take of the thylacine or a thylacine-like animal. Open-mindedness is a key feature of the residents of Byron Bay, according to Bruce Pringle. Australians have nicknamed this area of New South Wales the Rainbow Region because of the many hippies who have taken up residence there. No wonder they believe in this mysterious creature. People are here because they want to be here. You know, there's not a lot of jobs here or, or anything, so you, if, you, if you want to live here, you've got to try really hard, you know. You, it's, it's, you, 
th th there's problems, you know, you've got to find employment and stuff like that. So the people that are here have worked something out, you know, and they're independent-minded people. Michelle Dawson is an artist who embodies the free spirit of the region. This mythical creature fascinates her. I do have a bit of a thing for monsters or mythical beings. So a great love of sort of myths, legends and fairy tales kind of imbues a lot of the work. And animals that I'm really drawn to improbable looking creatures. So things that look proportionally wrong or like they shouldn't really exist. Australia's got a strange thing of sightings of creatures in their outback. There's a certain magic. You feel a certain magic about the possibility that you could be walking through the bush and experience that creature. I think, I do think it's exceptionally beautiful. You know, the head and the ears and the eyes and then those stripes and this idea that there was this um, creature that sort of looked like a wolfish dog with tiger stripes that was a marsupial with a backwards facing pouch just seemed incredible. Shortly after I came here that there was a spate of people claiming to have seen it here and that that's quite interesting in that those sightings go back to the early 60s. And when you read the descriptions, <laughs> that you have to actually say that they, they really, really clearly describe a Tasmanian tiger. It does disturb and surprise me when I see that on a general level, how little people know of it. There's good cave drawings of it. It just goes back so far, you know. But it did last for so long before we turned up, really. In Berlin, at the Museum of Natural History, the Australian paleontologist Michael Archer shares his passion for the thalassine. It makes me extremely sad. Uh, apart from seeing the most amazing animal in the world stuffed standing in a case when it should be live next to me, uh, when I read the label, the label says they went extinct because people changed the environment in which they live. That's not why they actually went extinct. They went extinct from lead poisoning. We shot them all to death. The last remnants of the tiger in this part of the world were down in Tasmania. And then uh, when white settlement happened there, um, there was a bounty put on the Tasmanian tiger because they were eating the farmer's sheep, you know, and, and so the tiger had to go. So, um, a lot of a lot of the uh, thylacines were killed then were shot off and uh, and you know you got money for shooting them uh, and also disease crept in um, we think um, and, and at some stage or other they reached that uh, biological critical minimum where they just don't exist so to cut a long story short it's by the human hand that 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 the thylacine is quite likely no longer here. The idea that they would actually literally hunt it to extinction, put a bounty on its head and wipe it out, that, that those early settlers in the main didn't see it as wondrous, they just saw it as a threat. Um, and maybe because it was so strange looking, that fear of the unknown. I think the global obsession with thylacines goes into this zone, fascinating zone, of cryptozoology. Um, we find people on every continent have imagined very strange creatures like Loch Ness Monster or like yetis and things, and they've grabbed them and they want to believe they actually exist. Um, in the case of the thylacine, there's no question about it. We know it existed. The argument is whether it still exists. So those same people who want yetis to be alive and the Loch Ness Monster to do his swimming in that loch in Scotland want the thylacine to be alive. These cryptozoologists get to be extremely serious, devoting their whole lives to the search for any evidence that would convince someone else that it's still here. Despite the scientific consensus that the thylacine is extinct, the cryptozoologist Gary Opit 
hopes to someday prove beyond a doubt its existence. So these two footprints uh, were made by Percy Trezise in 1906, 1984 and given to me. Uh, I've had them looked at by other thylacine researchers and they thought they did indeed look like thylacine uh, plaster cast footprints, but the problem with thylacines is they look very much like a dog and the footprints um, resemble dogs as well. So once again, even having plaster cast of the prints doesn't really prove anything. And Gary Opit continues his research at all costs. In the company of Wendy Bethel, he takes us into the tropical forests of Byron Bay. Today, I'm going to guide us into a piece of rainforest that I've never taken into taken anyone into before. And uh, it's particularly interesting because I've received several accounts of thylacines from that locality from several different witnesses. Here around Byron Bay, out in the hinterlands, there's some forests around here and some gullies and some bush and some rainforest around here. There's incredibly dense, wild country. Nobody goes, there's no cows, there's no sheep there, there's no dogs, there's nothing. You know, people don't go there rarely. A few occasional, occasional hippie will go wandering down through there. And if one of those guys or women says to me, I saw a thylacine, I'm going to say, yeah, cool. You know, don't tell anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Opitz's approach, meanwhile, is serious. He makes regular trips to the densest parts of the forest. Where we're going, it's a patch of undisturbed coastal rainforest dominated by bangalow palms. So it's a perfect habitat for native Australian animals and maybe even thylacines. We only discovered this forest by looking on the computer on Google Earth, examining the, our local area, and found a rainforest we didn't know existed Park here on the right. So we always need our backpack, in which we've got a pair of binoculars and a camera, a bit of water, and a bit of insect repellent, just in case uh, there are too many mosquitoes. And uh, all we have to do now is cross the road and head into the rainforest. This is the locality where there have been reports of thylacine-like animals, so perhaps there's one of those lurking just ahead. Oh, there's a real track in here. <laughs> Directly to the west of us, a local farmer on two occasions driving his tractor very early in the morning, uh, in, encountered an animal, very dog-like, with very distinct stripes on its back. Uh, and he was very sure that he was looking at a thylacine. And if it was in that open grassland just over there, then this would be part of its hunting territory. And it could move for scores of kilometres uh, along the coastland and inland on these wildlife corridors. So, now we've come to the wonderful Bangalow rainforest. This is the kind of country that they would very likely uh, forage through, looking for small animals, rats, mice, bandicoots. One of the reports that I received was of a farmer walking through some forest near his farm and in the base of a tree he found two animals around about the size of a small cat uh, with stripes on their backs and he realised he had found a couple of young thylacines. He had a good look at them and then off he went. If he'd picked those animals up he would have made one of the greatest zoological discoveries on Earth. The thylacine now would be a known surviving animal and uh, there would probably be an intensive breeding program with them. So is it possible, is it, is it possible that there's something out here or that there's still thylacines in, a, in the world or around here? It's, I, I, it's certainly possible, but is it probable? Anyway, we'll continue on. 
There's nothing like going off the beaten track with you. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> So from this side of the creek, we get a wonderful view of the rainforest. This would be perfect habitat for it uh, because it could hunt along these uh, grassy areas beside the creek and then it can c cross back into the forest on these fallen trees. I just find it that every single time someone sees one, that, that no one's able to photograph it or um, it's it sort of, you know, everyone's got camera phones and, and walks around with cameras, so why isn't there any photographic evidence? In the rainforest of Byron Bay, Gary Opet and Wendy Bethel continue their research in the hope of one day seeing a thalassine. Now, Wendy's deep in the forest. She doesn't know when, where she, we are. And so the Aboriginal people uh, had a particular call they used to use to um, find one another. And Australians have used it ever since. And it goes like this. Witnesses usually say that they can move with incredible speed and make very little noise. You can hear how much noise Wendy's making as she moves through the forest and Wendy's used to walking through the bush and that's one of the, the problems finding animals walking through a forest is that the animals can generally hear you coming. Isn't that a magnificent strangling fig tree? The largest tree in the forest. So I think the time has come for us to leave this wonderful palm grove and climb up into the old sand dunes. And a few short meters from this rainforest, the beach completely deserted. This just gives you an idea of how fabulous this coastline is. As you can see, almost no sign of civilization, no tourist resorts. Uh, very fortunate we have this magnificent ocean beach. According to Opet, human activity is so limited in this corner of Australia that it would not be surprising if a thalassine were hiding in the region. But today is not the day for him to make this incredible discovery. So now comes the most dangerous part crossing the road without getting run over. So this is a, a lace monitor or tree goanna. It's obviously the victim of a car strike. We didn't spot any thylacines or anything else, but it's very difficult to come across animals when you're walking through the bush like that. Hopefully one day we'll find a thylacine. <laughs> I, hope you, I hope we do. Yeah. <laughs> According to paleontologist Mike Archer, Gary Opet will never realize his dream of capturing the creature. Where's the hard evidence that it's still out there? Where is the squashed carcass on the road? Since 1930, with all of the vehicles in Tasmania killing everything else on a daily basis, why not one thylacine carcass? People say they see them everywhere. They see them on the mainland of Australia. I, I've had people tell me they see them in Texas and even in South America but it's all based on sightings. And sightings are not testable evidence. It's not the same as a bone or a hair or even a, a piece of poo. What you can do is examine the structure of the sighting. And when you do that, it turns out that the way people see thylacines, the time of day, the number of people who see it, the length of time of the duration of the sighting, it's the same kind of data that we have for flying saucer reports. So it makes people extremely skeptical that sightings are a credible basis for claiming they still exist. 
And apart from the sightings, there is zero evidence, zero hard evidence, that a thylacine survived in Tasmania after 1936 or on the mainland after 4,000 years ago. They're gone. I, I am very skeptical that they were so awesomely bright that they have made a collective decision since 1936 to never allow anybody to see them. They're just not there anymore. We have to get over it. But in 1996, the discovery of a thalassine carcass shook the scientific community and revived Gary Opitz's hopes of conclusively proving the existence of the creature. They did find a perfectly mummified carcass or body of a Tasmanian tiger in the Nullarbor Plains in Western Australia and it was in perfect condition, it still had the fur on it. They did a radiocarbon date on some of the skin and the, uh, the date received was 3,000 years old. Some friends of mine had found a mummy of a thylacine on the floor of a cave, appropriately called Thylacine Hole, on the Nullarbor in the southern part of the continent. At first they thought it was evidence that the thylacine had just recently fallen into the cave because it still had eyeballs, it had a tongue, it even had a musty smell. And they were ready to start to establish a reserve to protect the thylacine. It was such an exciting time. And then one paleontologist, Duncan Merrilies, said, hang on, before we jump to this conclusion, we should probably radiocarbon date the tissues, the dried skin. Um, and they did, and it turned out to be over 4,000 years old. But then 10 years later, they found a dingo completely rotted away in the same caves. And then they began to believe that the cave floods every year. So it couldn't possibly be 3,000 years old because the, the dingo carcass uh, could only be 10 years old and it had rotted away to a greater extent than the thylacine carcass. So, so it's a controversy. <laughs> I don't want to say that nobody has ever seen one. Our problem, for those of us who would love to know it is still out there, is that we need somebody to show us hard evidence. There are well-known mental phenomena that basically involve people seeing things that they, they love or they severely miss, somebody whose, whose loved one has died. Something like 10% of people will see that person on the street within a month. But if you really want to see something badly enough, your brain is designed to fill in the gaps. If you see an animal in the bush that's dog-like, your brain may add the stripes if you really want to see a thylacine. It's a very flexible organ. It's part of the reason why, frankly, seeing is not necessarily believing. Now, most people, uh, as we know, believe in shooting the messenger. If you don't like the news, then you blame the person that's delivered it. So if someone says that they've seen something that you don't believe could be possible, then you'll refuse to believe it and, and accuse the person of, of fabricating the, uh, the, uh, the report. If you receive enough of these reports, you know that there's, there's evidence coming in because the signal is continuing. You, you continually receive dissimilar descriptions from people who have never met each other, who are not interested in, in, in the animal, but they are interested in identification of something that is peculiar, a, a creature that they didn't know exist. I would like to find evidence one way or the other as to whether they exist or not, but uh, I, I cannot come up with a conclusive statement that it definitely exists or that it doesn't exist. All I can say is the anecdotal evidence shows that it exists because people continue to describe uh, really detailed observations of the animal. Outside the scientific debate on the current existence of the thalassine, Michelle Dawson focuses on its place in the hearts and minds of Australians. It just seems like a really miraculous being. Marsupial, tiger-striped, dog-headed, backwards-facing pouch creature. You know, they were supposedly wiped out because they thought they were killing the sheep, but um, later research and science would show that they're an incredibly shy, creature 
that lived mainly way up in the highlands and very rarely ventured down and lived off small rodents and things. So that this shy, strange, beautiful creature got sort of willfully wiped out seems just ineffably sad, really. Um, an idea that it might have survived would be beautiful. I think a lot of Australians would like to think that it was still there. It's not like they've been extinct for centuries, so, so there is still that, well, you know, if somebody took a, a pregnant mother away to the mainland, or if two of them hid away in the, up in the highlands of Tassie, this, this, not that long ago that the last one was seen, there is still, it's still possible that it could still be here. The scientist Mike Archer nurses a highly controversial dream to one day revive the species through DNA cloning. In 1990, I saw a little tiny baby thylacine preserved in alcohol in a jar in the Australian Museum. I was very excited. I knew alcohol was a DNA preservative. I asked colleagues, was there any possibility? Did they think? These were geneticists. Could we try to get DNA out of that pickled pup and use it somewhere in the future to bring the thylacine back? They laughed. So when I became director in 1999, I thought, why don't we just give it a go? Nobody else thinks it's possible. Let's start. If we don't start, it will never happen. So I put a team together, and they went into this pickle pup, and they found DNA. We tested the DNA. It was unmistakably thylacine DNA. So we were convinced that we had recovered the whole genome of a thylacine from this specimen. And they checked the teeth and bones of specimens that were already in the museum collection, and they produced better quality DNA. We had, as far as we could see, everything you could need to try to put a thylacine back on the earth again. So I guess at this point, if I ask the same geneticists now, do they still think it's ridiculous? Well, many of them have changed their mind. And in fact, many of them have joined teams all around the world to see if it's possible to bring extinct animals back. Projects are happening everywhere. The, the mammoth, the passenger pigeon, dodos. The thylacine is one of those projects. And at that point, we have a new tool for increasing the biodiversity on the planet by hopefully bringing back some of the most important iconic animals that in particular we, humans, have driven inappropriately into the night of extinction. For Bruce Pringle, the thylacine is strictly an artistic influence, but its extinction has also influenced his work. I did this little sculpture. Um, it's uh, it's the from the from the Bible, from the New Testament. There's these three crosses where the Christ was crucified, and there were two thieves that were crucified along with him. And uh, I did this little picture of these three crosses. This little steel thing is pretty rough, with a bunch of thylacines just down at the foot of the crosses. And, and my idea was that, uh, you know, those two thieves were forgiven their sins, but the thylacines had no forgiveness. They weren't, there, there was no uh, redemption for them. In fact, it even says in the Bible, if we're going to get hung up about God's word, that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. God's message to the people who were writing the Bible was, you humans created death, it's your job to undo it. So as far as I'm concerned, we have the holy sanction to try to do this work. If science could, can, could come up with that and clone a Tasmanian tiger, and obviously do another one so they could reproduce, it would be an absolute brilliant thing to happen to Australia. Who knows, maybe they will one day. Maybe there'd be Tasmanian tigers running everywhere. It would be really brilliant, but the thing is what, you know, so it would be lovely to be able to release them down in the west of Tasmania again if, if they're not there already. Uh, it would be a bit of a problem if they are there already and then it's like, hey, you know, what are you doing here? No, I'm a test tube. I'm better than you. you know? I've got better stripes. 
There are those people who say, this is not about cloning, it's what they, I think, cleverly call clowning. You know, that we're wasting our time because they argue this still out there. We were playing God when we exterminated those species. I'd like to say we should be playing smart human to try to bring it back. Why not? Why not? You know, if we can do this, let, let's do it. I don't think it can hurt. I think if there was ever a community that would really, really want to have a thylacine, <laughs> It's probably us. <laughs>
Gary Opet continues his quest. The mystery of the Tasmanian tiger continues to grow. And that's why we, we, just, we just keep an open mind and, uh, and keep looking. I love the people here. They embrace nature. They embrace tolerance. You know, beautiful, um, sharing people. We still have this reputation that we're like dope-smoking hippies. <laughs> It's a crazy place, but uh, it's our crazy place. We love it.